going on everybody welcome to the alex Cuesta show how's everybody doing out there on this wednesday november 9th of 2023 for episode number 98 how uh you know david you're still here you still keep finding your way to the show every week and i don't i know i know and there's currently a cat on my lap because she decided she wasn't getting enough attention well i mean you decided to bring our family there and she doesn't like our family that's true. Torturing you. So it is your fault. You are, you, we're going to call PETA on you because you're torturing a cat. And, <laughs> no, you know, because no, she's actually happy right now. Okay. No, right. well, <laughs> for once somebody's happy with you. But anyway, let's jump into the show. Um, before we get going, if you like what you hear today, like, share, follow, subscribe, rate five stars, Spotify, and iTunes. Spread this word of mouth. Go find us on the socials. Go search the Alex Questa show. Before we jump into this week's show, last week we had a great show, and I want to announce that last week's guest, Bill Reuter, um, David wasn't here for that one, but it was just was me not. and him one-on-one. He was a local candidate in my area in Poughkeepsie for the town board. Happy to report that Bill won his race last week. Week. Let's go. And he will be representing the first ward, who is the ward next to me, but he's, you know, a good conservative guy. And me and Bill have plans to do some things over here in the area and could hopefully revamp the Republican Party, add some. It's all because of the show, right? It's all, listen, the show's good. Yeah. Luck. You take this the show credit for it. <laughs> is great luck. I'm going to take credit. Anytime that any of our guests do anything good, it's automatically going to be like a feather in our cap. Yeah. So when, you know, when Derek Evans, when he wins the, the Congress seat in the House in West Virginia, that's going to be our credit. I'm going to tell Derek he owes it to us. But <laughs> this week, our guest is somebody that, you know, I think in the future, we are going to owe a lot to this guest because I feel like she's one of the most important people in the current public discourse around education, around children and things like that. She is Tiffany Justice. She is a co-founder of Moms for Liberty. What's going on, Tiffany? Hey, so glad to join you tonight. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, we're excited. And, you know, me and David, we have followed uh, what you've done with Moms for Justice, uh, Moms for Liberty and everything like that and how, you know, influential and awesome it's been and how quickly it came. Now, I just want to ask for people that don't know, why start Moms for Liberty? What is Moms for Liberty? So first of all, I just want to be clear, it's not just me. So I co-founded Moms for Liberty with Tina Deskovich. Um, she's awesome. She's a, a fellow mom, uh, was a school board member too. I served on school board from 2016 to 2020. And then we have amazing members all across the country that are making the work happen. Um, so Moms for Liberty, you know, we may be leading from a national perspective um, and, and you know, be the face and the voice often when we do interviews. But this work is really about decentralized leadership and helping people to be leaders in their own community. And so I love that you guys are highlighting other leaders like in your local area. All politics are local. It's the most important. uh, uh, These are the most important elections that you really take part in because local uh, decisions affect your life um, in a a very real way. Um, Why start Moms for Liberty? Um, I served on school board. And I had four kids in school and it gave me a very interesting perspective uh, when it came to policy. I was um, there on the school board, reviewing the budget, working with the superintendent to create policy and then watching as that policy was implemented in the schools and procedure. But then I also had kids in school. So I unpack a lot of backpacks. So I get to see (laughs) what does this actually look like playing out in the schools. Mm -hmm. And then my friends have kids in schools and different schools. Right. And so we'd be at the sports field and, you know, I'd hear from them what it looked like in their school. And so um, there's oftentimes a real disconnect between the policies that a school board passes and the way that the procedure actually is implemented uh, in the schools. And um, Tina and I both saw that the teachers unions had a real undue influence in the decision making process in the school districts. And that largely was because the teachers unions control most school boards. They've been really playing in these elections for a very long time and they've been uncontested. And so Moms for Liberty was really born out of wanting to give parents a voice wanting them to help to be help them to be effective advocates. So our mission statement that we wrote that when we first started in December of 2020, uh, we launched January 1st, 2021, but we took December to to kind of craft the organization. Mm-hmm. And the mission statement is to unify, educate and empower parents to defend their parental rights at all levels of government. And uh, that's the mission statement that has guided us well until this day. 
And I really feel like you guys are one of the big main foundations for we've seen states now doing parental bill of rights and things like that. And, um, you know, we see what Christopher Rufo is doing with a lot of the school stuff and things like that. And I feel like without you guys making noise as grassroots, just moms really wanting to get involved. And I believe I first heard you. I believe from Glenn Beck. I feel like he was one of the first people that was in the Glenn. That was Tina. Yeah. And I yep. heard about that. And I was like, this is cool. And I also listen to new discourses with James Lindsay and James Lindsay constantly sings your praises as deserved. So uh, it's, you know, you guys are the absolute epitome of if you want to make an impact, you just have to do it. You don't have to be somebody big to just go and, you know, have a name. If you have a purpose, if you have a meaning, you're strong and you have conviction and it's the right thing to do, it will catch fire. And just what you two do and what you guys have grown. And we had um, one of your people that you work with, Jennifer McWilliams, on the show, um, awesome. uh, you know, and she's fantastic. And just I think what you guys are doing is amazing. So I'm pumped to have you you know, on the show. It's a, actually an honor. And you're it's something for, me and you. David were like, if we can get Tiffany Justice, like we would be pumped. <laughs> So, oh, that's so, we, so nice. You you Thank were a you. bucket list person for this show. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, James is awesome. James is on our advisory board. I went to uh, a seminar that James held in Miami uh, early on in the start of Moms for Liberty, and I just felt like we needed to make the information that he was talking about palatable to the American yes. public. Yep. And he spoke at our summit. And if, if you haven't heard him speak, he, he spoke about struggle sessions, but he said something funny during the summit. And then he later, he apologized because James is one of the nicest guys I know. Mm -hmm. But what he said on stage was, he said, you know, I was talking to Tiffany and she said, James, you got to dumb it down for the moms. It's not that we're stupid. No. Moms, our moms aren't stupid. I'm not stupid. We're just really busy. We've got four, you know, I've got four kids. We're working, we're running around yeah. from, you know, taking care of kids to our jobs, to mm -hmm. after school activities, uh, family responsibilities. And so, you know, I, I just said to James, let's try to figure out how we make this so that moms are doing laundry, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're in the car and, you know, they may not know Marx and Marcusa and, and Foucault and, um, you know, we're talking about and queer Nerida. theory yeah. and postmodernism. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, unless you really have studied that in school yep. and that was something that you intentionally studied, um, you know, you may not, and, and, and even if you did, you may not have a good recollection of it in your, you know, thirties and forties. Um, you know, it's a heavy lift and mm -hmm. I just am so incredibly thankful for James really doing the bullets and looking mm -hmm. at awesome. the information that he's sharing through a different lens and kind of breaking it down a bit so that it's more palatable for all of us. And the work that he does, he just changed his name on Twitter to Wilkes Set of Stone. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's probably <laughs> the most accurate. Yeah. yeah, I think it's probably the most accurate uh, descriptor he's had uh, on Twitter so far. Well, I mean, like you said, moms are really busy. And also the stuff that is going on in schools. And like you said, learning about Marx and Derrida, for all of them. And it's made needlessly complicated in order to confuse you. And if someone knows what they're talking about and they're on that side, they can make you feel dumb if you don't know exactly what they're doing. Well, so postmodernism asks a, a really interesting question and, and and answers it in a really stupid way, yes. which is why are the things the way they are? And yeah. what it answers is, well, because there's no real truth. Yeah. It's just, you know, and, and so that's just a stupid. That's just a stupid answer. And so yeah. people who have common sense and who, you know, are just believe in truth that's a really that that's a really crummy answer and so mm -hmm. it makes you immediately just not be able to engage with it because a yeah. lot of people can't even begin to understand how that could be yep. something that most that a lot of people believe and you know me and dave have talked about this show all, on a lot is like the power of just kind of saying no to those type of people right when they like try to confuse it and say well this is that and you know nothing is real it's just kind of like no you're wrong there is black and white there is truth and <laughs> there are men and there are women yes. there are men sex and is binary yes sorry guys <laughs> and gender is quite literally a synonym for sex they changed that around but it was always basically a synonym used interchangeably so i want to jump into the meat and potatoes because sure. one of the things that you have been really talking about lately is literacy rates and literacy rates amongst this country. And you put out um, a post on Twitter and it had for fourth grade reading in 2022 that we are not proficient in this country, that literacy rates for white children are at 58 percent, Hispanic up 79 and uh, 
Is that not proficient? 79 not proficient? That's not proficient. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. not yes. proficient. Yes. Yeah. So, so you've got black students at 17%, tw- Hispanic students at 21%. Mm-hmm. Just to be mm-hmm. clear, some of those Hispanic yeah. students are English as a second language learners. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is crazy town that you've got kids who don't even speak English as a first language performing yeah. better than black students. Yeah. And then you have um, white students um, under, as you said, uh, under you know 50%. Yeah. Um, Literacy rates are declining. They continue to decline. COVID did us no favors. Mm -hmm. Um, But the bottom line is this. 99% of kids have the ability to learn to read uh, by third grade. That's neurodiverse kids as well. So you're talking Mm -hmm. about kids completely across the spectrum, even, you know, dyslexic kids, like given the right uh, tools and resources in the classroom and support, kids can learn to read. So why isn't that happening? I mean, have you found like looking at things? Because I know, again, going back to James, because he's been an educator. And if you listen to James, the 300 level college course, but you can absorb some of it. But he talks a lot about Paulo Freire and going on to the method that Paulo Freire, uh, along with Antonio Gramsci in invading the schools, yeah. we are living in Freire in schools right now. And he uses a lot of the dialogical method and um, all that type of stuff. Are we seeing that kids aren't learning literacy because they're using more Freudian style. Yeah. I mean, the purpose of school is not to create college and career ready people to give children practicable skills Mm -hmm. like reading, writing and math. But the purpose of schools has changed and has been much more a focus of, of awakening a critical consciousness in the child. And we see that every day. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you can look no further than the NEA's curriculum guide based on the 17 sustainable development goals of the United Nations to mm-hmm. see, you know, this global influence affecting our, our nation and our education system. And again, not prioritizing literacy, but pri- prioritizing political activism. And um, it's done in many different ways. It's done in all uh, different courses now. It's not just relegated to social emotional learning or the morning time, but it is literally critical theory is woven into math and reading and science and social studies and history and all of the things the kids are learning and doing. And um, the kids are not okay. They're not learning to read. They're not learning to do math. They're not learning to write. And they're also uh, displaying um, crazy rates of mental health issues, uh, anxiety Mm -hmm. and depression. And so, you know, it's time, I think, for American parents to take back the wheel. Um, You know, conservatives in general have seeded the ground. Alex and and David, they Mm -hmm. they really have focused a lot and put all of their, their eggs in the school choice bucket. And I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of school choice and educational freedom. And I'm so glad that they have done that work to, you know, to sow the seeds of that because we are beginning to reap some of the benefits of the work they have done. Mm -hmm. But in the interim, they have seeded the ground in public schools. And that has allowed um, the left to really come in and to capture all of these institutions. And um, our voices haven't been heard and we haven't been as involved as we needed to be um, as parents or as conservatives. And, uh, you know, so the lift is heavy right now. Yeah. And I would actually say that, you know, the way it's been caught, especially from you guys and from James in schools right now, we kind of still caught it at a good time because we're seeing the fruits from mainly this really being put in college first. So we're seeing a lot of people who just coming out of college and even my generation, just the way they think already, especially with the current events happening with Israel and and Palestine. We, We can see the way that they actually lean already but that hasn't necessarily been implemented other than than recently it it has but not as hardcore in in the younger schools so we already see what it could do to mainly like high school college kids and now luckily we're actually churning and trying to correct this before it can truly affect a child throughout their whole entire developmental stage and throughout their whole entire young life no, I agree with you. But I mean, the thing the, so they're fully operational now. This mm-hmm. is why people yes. are always like, oh, they're not hiding. Well, no, I mean, you can't make something yep. happen unless you put it into full yep. operational mode. So there's no hiding what they're doing. It has mm-hmm. to be public because they mm-hmm. have to make it happen. So, yes, you're right. From a generational standpoint with the children, I think that we have time and an ability to catch mm-hmm. up and to start correct, start to correct course. Mm-hmm. But from an educator perspective, from the people that are, yes. you know, teaching in the yes. schools, the 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 capture of the institution and the work that was done mm-hmm. to really 
uh, indoctrinate and then to um, allow a whole new class to flourish, to go in and to capture the institution and then to mm-hmm. continue on the work of communism. I mean, I'm not going to, you know, it's, I'm not going to sugarcoat is. anything. Yeah. Right. Um, and Marxism, um, those people are there. And their goal is to continue mm-hmm. to indoctrinate. So, um, you know, while you're right, I think we have a, a real ability to stop the indoctrination from a kid standpoint. Yes. I think we still have a real concern about the fact that the yep. institutions yep. are captured and how are we going to root these people out of the institutions? Mm-hmm. Definitely. Now, can you, because so in my work nine to five, I work with a lot of kids. I work with high school kids, generally 16 and up. And I do hear a ton of them talking about their mental health, saying that they have anxiety, saying that they have things like that. Can you please start a campaign and a push to just a campaign called It's Just Puberty? Because (laughs) the issue right now that I am seeing and that I even tell these kids back in the day, what you were going through would just have been called puberty because we're telling these kids going through one of the toughest times in their life, the formidable years where they're trying to figure out where they fit in society what clothes they like, whether a zit is going to ruin their day. Can they go to school that day because they have one? And then we're telling them. They wear a mask, Alex. They'll just oh, put a mask on. You just got to put a mask on. You know, Worst party is going to make the zits worse. Yeah, <laughs> like, that is horrible. <laughs> Actively make it worse. But can we just like, because I feel like Moms for Liberty would be a perfect platform to start the campaign called It's Just Puberty. Because yeah. we're telling these kids, you have panic attacks, you have an anxiety. And don't get me wrong. There are some kids that do suffer from legitimate mm-hmm. mental illness. And like the left does with every other issue that has a legitimate base, they conflate it, they weaponize it, and they use it, right? Like there are some gay kids. There are some, There, you know, I know Billboard Chris likes to say there are no trans kids, but there are kids who do have mental, you know, gender dysphoria. That is a legitimate thing. And they conflate it and they make it and they weaponize it. So I feel like one where place we can start battling it is starting to bring back the fact that puberty occurs, kids are confused, it's a difficult time of life. No, you do not have anxiety. You are probably not depressed. You don't have panic attacks. You just feel the pressure of being a kid. And we need yeah, to let kids go through would, that again. Yeah, no, I don't disagree with you. First of all, I mean, show me the girl who loved going through puberty. I, you know, it's 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 not easy for boys. Mm-hmm. I, I have mm-hmm. boys, uh, but generally they end up being stronger and feeling, you know, really growing into their masculinity. For girls, your the changes that happen to your body are really hard, mm-hmm. um, and it, it makes people notice you and treat you in a different way, um, in a more sexual way, which is hard to deal with sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, girls develop at different rates. Um, you know, I, I'd be lying. If I told you wearing a bra was fun, uh, it's still not fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> not gonna, you know, I mean, you know, I'm a normal person. I, you know, it's it's nice not if to. If he's about to, to join the burn your bra, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, but but you know, changing as a woman and then uh, certainly getting your period and having to balance mm-hmm. and deal with that, which I, I continue to think men have absolutely no freaking idea of what that's like. And I don't want to. I don't want to. I love the fact that there's like, biological no, no, no. differences. I'm great with those. I love it. <laughs> yeah, But it's not easy. And, and so you're right. I think, you know, the bottom line is there is just some normal developmental things that happen with kids that are not mm-hmm. easy. I'm a mom of four. And, you know, it's just part of life. However, I would also say that the teaching in the classroom, the critical theory really does put the weight of the world on kids' shoulders. And climate and, change every year telling them. Yeah, I mean, climate change, everything. I mean, I remember recycling was big when I was in school. We were the ozone mm-hmm. layer society. Our, yeah, my generation yeah, yeah. was the ozone layer has a hole in Dead it. Dead serious. A girl on my bus cried because she was convinced we were going to die soon because of global warming. <laughs> I, yeah, remember no yeah, yeah. I remember that. I remember that. So I think that there's an enormous um, a weight put on kids, you know, even with COVID, you know, mm-hmm. w- when in the history of the world do we ever expect kids to safeguard and keep the adults safe and yeah. protected? Right. But yet during COVID, it was just the idea that kids were vectors of disease and they needed to mask up in order to keep adults safe. We, You know, that, that's just ridiculous. And so, um, you know, but that's kind of where we are. So I think it's a bit of a combination of the two. I think that, the, you know, just natural development has been weaponized. And, and I agree with you that, you know, kids are kind of diving really deep um but then also we you know we locked them down and we caused them to miss classes and to feel anxiety and stress and you know to think that you know the world was ending with covid uh when you know it was a, a mild cold for most kids um and so i i think that 
there's a lot of weapon. I think fear is just a really useful weapon. Always has and been. a lot of people use it to control. And I think the kids, you know, kind of get lumped into that too. And I, I do have to ask this. It just actually came to my mind because of a phrase you said about kids being vectors of diseases. This has nothing to do with what I put on the itinerary. So I hope this didn't do out of left field. But does, do you think this has uh, some of this influence has anything to do with like the, the like, rapid rise of like an anti-natalist movement that we've seen in the West. And I mean, that goes hand in hand with a lot of green movement of like, basically humans are the disease on the planet. So why would you even have kids? And, you know, some articles, not even recently from a bit ago where it's just like, costs too much to have a kid or like it's it, life is just better without a kid. <laughs> like you Yeah. I mean, I'll that. take you, I'll take you on a really like an interesting deep dive for a second. Mm-hmm. So uh, in Iowa, they use a curriculum called Amplify. And uh, I guess they were utilizing uh, some books in the classroom called The Shadow Children. And um, there was a real issue with these books. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they're just novels. Yeah. And so um, one of the moms in Iowa contacted me and said, I've got a neighbor. Her son's really upset. She's pregnant with her third child. He's reading these books in the classroom that talk about how if you have more than two children, the other children are called shadow children. If the government finds out about them, they shoot and kill them. And I was like, whoa, how old was the child reading this grade? Yeah, what it's you? a lot for fifth, sixth, seventh grade. Yeah, and so then aggressive. I went and I researched the book and looked up the author and the author uh, in talking about writing the books was really um, interested in climate change and uh, the, uh, you know, one child movement in China and wrote the book with no specific location mm-hmm. so that uh, people could could kind of figure it that it was happening anywhere. And she wanted to, to in, insert these issues. So then we get back to Ferrari and the generative themes being entered into the classroom. Oh, mm-hmm. And and now you have a little kid who's worried because mm-hmm. maybe there won't be enough food in the world to be able to feed the baby that his mom is carrying. Um, and why, again, are we reading this book in fifth, yeah. sixth, seventh grade? What is the point of this? And the thing is, that sounds like an interesting book if you're into dystopian novels, right? If you're an adult and you like dystopians, it could be an interesting tale to read, but not for. And let's put into perspective how old a fifth, 11. sixth, seventh mm-hmm. grader is. Mm-hmm. It is. 10 11, 12, at the youngest 13. age, 12, 13. So you're asking kids that are just at the beginning of puberty. They're still in the mommy phase around five, you know, fifth grade. You know, they're just starting to break out of like the mommy daddy phase, fifth, sixth grade. And now you're asking them to combat, like you said, the generative themes of world ending things, you know, like big time societal questions that adults tackle that adults argue over that we can't, you know, absolutely put our finger on with some of this stuff. And yeah. But like you said, it's a generative themes. It's turning every single person from a young age into an activist. The whole goal is activism starting at a young age. And that's where it's important for people like you, people like us to know this. Now, in what you've been dealing with, we could talk about this us three because, you know, we've we've read Freddie. We know about Herbert Marcuse. We know these things. How are you trying to get this out in layman's terms? To the mom that's doing a ton of things, to the dad that's working a ton of hours as well. And everyone that's trying to just get through their life, maybe they pay attention to politics a little bit, but they don't dive into philosophy Mm -hmm. like this. How are you explaining it to them? Why this, you know, not just that the book is bad for your kid, but what they're trying to do to your kid through this book. I think most parents are feeling it. They're seeing it. Um, you know, they know that their child isn't doing well. They're not learning. They're not enjoying going to school. That's the first real mm-hmm. e- evidence that a parent has that a child isn't learning well in school. If they don't want to go most, you should, your kids should want to go to school. Yeah. They should be excited to go to school, especially in elementary school, right? The work mm-hmm. gets heavier in middle and high school. Maybe it's harder. It's more challenging, but you know, you should have your kids wanting to go to school. And unfortunately that's not the case across the United States right now. Not a lot of kids um, want to go to school. Um, so parents just are feeling it naturally, I think, you know, and um, during COVID, uh, I think there were a lot of parents that thought their kids were doing okay. And then COVID happened and they've got their child at the kitchen table and mom's doing the dishes or, you know, um, working or, Mm -hmm. you know, trying to figure out how they're going to make the make ends meet while they uh, aren't allowed to work or their business is shut down. And then parents are like, wait a second. Like you're you really aren't writing very well. Like you're not holding a pencil properly. 
And and you can't write a couple sentences together and, and you're having a really hard time answering these questions or, you know, you're being asked to read this, but you're reading fluency, you're reading out loud, but parents hadn't been, ha- you hadn't had homework coming yeah. home with for parents, right? Parents have kind of been conditioned like school happens at school and when they come home, we're not going to send homework home. Mm-hmm. And then you have this transition from textbooks being physical to we're going to all leave them all at school to mm-hmm. now everything's going to be digital, which means that they can, can be changed whenever mm-hmm. they want. My kindergartner and- has a Chromebook that they require that they use like uh, like you 10 hours a week Chromebook? Yeah. Ten, like something like that and they require or like a few i don't know what the exact number is but they require that kindergartners at five years old oh yeah acclimated with one the, to one yep like i i, I don't unfortunately enough when we did when we met with the teacher she's like i hate this stuff i do the bare minimum i don't go any over but just the fact that they have to do it and it's like you said they're getting them used to doing everything digital they're getting them used to throwing it on there so like you said as a parent we used to have to take our textbooks home. We used to have to do the stupid little wrapping and everything, make sure mm-hmm. that whatever with the little book socks. But my mom and dad could go and as I'm reading, read over my shoulder and see. And, you know, if they look at it and they could say and look and go, all right, that, that you know, what you're reading right there, that's not completely true. It's fine. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, do what you got to do, but that's not actually the correct history. This is what happened there. But do what you got to do for school, but just know that this isn't right. Right. But that doesn't happen as much anymore. It like, doesn't because you don't have computer. parents as involved as they, you know, could or should be. But the school district, you know, it's it's a it's it's a double edged sword. Like parents have definitely uh, abdicated some of their involvement, like to the district, to the schools. But the schools have wanted them to do that. Mm. And so they've made it really easy. And so, um you know, I believe I choose to believe that uh, the vast majority of parents love their children. And yep. want what's best for them, even if they don't know what the best decision is to make right then in the moment or they haven't had mm-hmm. that modeled for them. I do mm-hmm. believe that most parents, the vast majority of parents love their children and want what's best. Um, and so if you know that and then you also know that parents are the number one driver of student success, which is the absolute truth, there's nothing that uh that substitutes an involved parent in the child's life, then schools should be rolling out the red carpet for parents. Absolutely. They should be involving them at every single turn. What? How can we make this easier? How do we connect with you? When can we hold these meetings? How much information do you need? When you request information, they should be giving you everything, but that's not happening. No. And so the question really then becomes why do schools not want students to be successful? And are they willing to uh, limit student success because they don't want to involve the questions of parents and the scrutiny of parents? And that's where it seems like we are right now. So how do you guys reach into the inner cities? Because you know what, like right now, a lot of suburban parents are very much involved, right? And they have a little more potentially free time or they're a little more on top of it. But a lot of the numbers, the numbers that we talked about with literacy, with the Hispanic and with the black kids, a lot of them are inner city. And how do we get the outreach there? Because you know what? It can get changed in suburbia, but it'll always be the same thing. But the city schools never get better, right? They only get worse. So is there any way that you guys are doing to do an outreach into these inner city areas to try and make it better? Or what have the, what has it been like trying to battle with that? Yeah, we're doing some town halls. Uh, we have a town hall coming up on Monday in Atlanta. Uh, that's November 13th. And then we have another one on December 2nd uh, in downtown Chicago. I think it's 67th and King. So we are uh, we held our, our summit in Philadelphia. We are going into cities. We are not ceding any ground. We are not taking any stars off of the flag of the United States of America. Mm-hmm. Um, what uh, and then I'm going to be going to New York, I believe, in January to do a town hall. What part uh, of downtown. New York? I'm in Poughkeepsie. There you go. I'm not sure exactly where the town hall might is going to be. Maybe at a, a friend's school in the Bronx. I'm working cool. on that right now. Very cool. Um, but American parents in cities are waking up to, and what they are seeing in New York and in Chicago is um, the fact that their children are lo- losing a lot of services right now. Uh, in New York, I don't I think I don't think any of the pools were filled this summer. They there was a they said that there wasn't enough money in the city to fill any of the rec pools. Um, Randall Field is being used as a tent city. The children do not have any uh, green space. Uh, funny that they don't use Central Park as the tent city and let the kids have Randall Field. No, of course. Um, not. You, 
Right. You've seen parents in Chicago stepping up and speaking out extremely concerned Mm -hmm. about the migrant crisis Mm -hmm. in Chicago and the fact that their students and 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 their kids services are being cut uh rec services are being cut and uh the money is going to migrant services yeah. and parents are upset mm-hmm. you know and and rightly so yeah. um so you know you've got baltimore city schools you're spending an enormous amount of money uh on education and you've got 0% of kids proficient in math or reading and 14 schools in baltimore city um and so you know uh, I think parents have been conditioned for a long time um, that the teachers unions are their friends. Uh, You know, teachers unions, oftentimes teachers, school districts oftentimes are the largest employer in any given location. Mm -hmm. Uh, The largest amount of money uh, in the, in the County is spent on education. Um, So there's been this kind of, you know, pass that I think the districts have gotten for a while, but parents are waking up. And they're learning that, you know, well, my kid's getting an A or a B or a C, but does that mean that they're actually getting the skills they need to be successful yeah. in life? Yeah. And, um, you know, that obviously is show we're, we're seeing now that they are not. So, you know, obviously your mission in Moms for Liberty is to get these parents waking up, get them involved, get the kids a better education. But also when we talk about the inner cities, how do we get across to these parents that you guys voted for this? This is what majority of you have voted for. Majority of you have voted for the policies that have brought these migrants to your streets. Majority of you have voted for the policies that are going to have your elected officials allocate that money to them in order to gain political points. So is there a way to like kind of get that across as well that, guys, it's, it can change. Waking up is great. But you can't keep going in the same direction because we can say all we want here. But if you continue to do that, you're going to get the same results. Yeah, I mean, I I think just being honest and showing what's happening, you know, but you look at, you know, Chicago had Lori Lightfoot, uh, who railed against the unions, to be honest with you, in her last in in the last part of her term. She, you know, she was not she went up against the unions continuously. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not a huge Lori Lightfoot fan, but I certainly appreciated the fact that she was doing that. Uh, And then you got Brandon Johnson, who is uh, further to the left than than Lori Lightfoot, if that's possible, and um, really destroying the city. So um, I don't know how bad it has to get in order for people to recognize that the people that they're electing are not representing the will of the people and and helping their families. But I would imagine that the the crime increases uh, are going to continue to push people further and further to recognizing that they need to vote differently. It's just really unfortunate that that's what the the motivating factor is going to be. It's going to be more lost life, more crime, more danger uh, and more kids who suffer. So as we continue to talk about, you know, more jumping into the education of kids, we're starting to see the development of something called community schools. Now, if you know, we know what it is, but for people that don't know, with the inclusion of things like DIE, Diversion, Inclusion, Equity, and SEL programs and things like that, and the Freudian activism with um, generative uh, themes and stuff like that, we're seeing a lot of that happening. What are community schools what are they trying to do in the schools to create them that way and how how do we combat that as well what are the strategies there to combat that yeah so community schools uh community schools are this idea uh born out of the cdc the whole school whole child whole community model Mm -hmm. um where uh the government would like to push all services for that that meet the, to meet the needs of kids and families out of the schools and um it makes a lot of sense in some ways because the school is there right mm-hmm. the building's there you have an ability to connect the kids with the services so there's a lot of things that lead itself to this being you know not the worst idea ever except for the fact that it, it continues to disenfranchise the parent in the life of the child. Mm-hmm. Um, and, it, and and there's no amount of money. There will never be enough services that you can give a family through that public school system to meet the needs of the family. Yep. Um, I saw something the other day, an advertisement from Whirlpool, and they are donating washers and dryers to schools. And I put it out on Twitter and I said, like, really? 
And people said, how dare you? Don't you want children to have clean clothes? And this started with free lunches and free breakfast and stuff. And that was kind of like the soft feelers for how much it's going to be accepted. Yeah. So community schools, there's just no end. But let's talk about the laundry for a second. Mm -hmm. Really? (laughs) I mean, we're going to put washers and dryers in schools. So explain to me. So the kids are going to do their laundry at school? Or are the teachers going to do the laundry like they don't have enough on their plates? Yeah. We're going to have the teacher. Are we going to hire people to run the laundry at the schools so the kids are going to bring their laundry to school to wash and dry their laundry? I saw uh, some other programs where there were grocery stores being put in schools so that children could bring home groceries for their family uh, for dinner. Uh, is that the responsibility of the child? You know, I think it's time in America we stop treating children like adults and we stop treating adults like children. Well, you know, and, you know they had a right. model, the student's the teacher, the teacher's the student. There is no right. difference between an adult and a child in their thinking. And that's what right. they're trying to get across. Yeah. So community schools are an effort uh, by uh, the government to usurp local control. Um, yeah. it, it will come through uh, different grants through the federal system. Uh, it will uh, encourage uh, community partners. So outside organizations and the left has like 21,000 single issue organizations to mm-hmm. meet the needs of communities. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it empowers them uh, as specifically Planned Parenthood. Mind you, they're one of the lead groups uh, to come into schools to provide services uh, to students. And when you look at informed consent being lowered in many places to 12 years old, um, again, I don't know a lot of 12 year olds that know their medical history and should be making informed that that can make informed decisions for themselves from a medical standpoint. My 12 year old would eat Oreos all day if I let them. (laughs) Right. Truthfully, Um, I mean, I'm 27 and I could probably eat Oreos. Sounds sounds pretty good to me as well. (laughs) And so that's that's community schools. Community schools um, is a great idea in theory where you be able to meet the needs of every kid. And, uh, you know, the arguments that are made are, are good arguments. You know, well, if a kid has a toothache and then how can they focus on school? Yeah, it's true. That's really tough. I would imagine it'd be really hard if you have a cavity or a really bad toothache to focus on school. But right now we have a system where if your kid gets licensed school, uh, you know, they send them home and they're not allowed to come back until the license is gone. And you don't have anybody coming to your house to help yep. pick out the nits. Nope. I mean, you're doing that by yourself. <laughs> but apparently if your child decides they want to change their uh, their gender, supposedly, which is impossible, but, you know, let's say for a moment that it is, um, then the school will embark on that journey with your child without your consent or knowledge. And so it's just this upside down world where we are right now, where they're going to pick and choose what they want to have to deal with. And it's going to be used as a weapon to continue to drive a wedge between the parent and the child with the um, ultimate goal being communism or the revolution. And James says a lot, and I think it's always really important. People look for like, well, why this? Why that? Why this? How is this Mm -hmm. connected to this? Mm -hmm. It's just all in service of the revolution. Sometimes Mm -hmm. it's connected, sometimes it isn't, but it's all in service of the revolution. Absolutely. And I just want to let anybody know it's listening. Whenever you hear anybody talking about education, they talk about a holistic method. Yeah. What we've been trained to think of holistic is, oh, it's earthy. Oh, it's natural. That's where our minds go to because of like holistic methods of medicine and things like that. When they're talking about that education, they're talking about exactly what Tiffany said when it comes to the CDC and the 17, uh, the 17 goals with the whole child, the whole school, whole community. That is what they mean. Holistic. They're talking about it in that way. So um, I have a question. How much has the ESSA Act, Every Student Succeeds Act, helped out schools to be able to do what they want to do at the community schools? Um I know that that's pretty important to them being allowed to do a lot of these things and get funding to do a lot of these things. Yeah, there's been a lot of data sharing that's happened that's opened up um, the the way that information is shared about students and their needs. There's been a lot of surveying that's happened um, of kids in schools. And even though there are federal laws that prohibit that surveying from happening, the Protection of People Rights Amendment, um, it, it, for example, uh, a federal law that says there should be no surveying of children of their political affiliations, their religious beliefs, their sexual pro- pro- um, pro- Prolific um, preference. Lead. So preference. Yeah, preference. But there was more than that. Gotcha. Um, sexual orientation or, mm-hmm. or, or feelings. Um, mm-hmm. 
proclivities. I think yeah. that's what gotcha. I was trying that's to get good. to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that this it's still happening. And so, um, you know, Obama didn't Obama did a lot of things uh, that uh, have not been good. Uh, for schools and for kids. Um, a lot of the Title IX stuff was started when Obama was in office, and, and we're now seeing that kind of coming into fruition, really the doing away of, of private spaces uh, for girls and, and you know, respecting girls on sports mm-hmm. teams and things, and this idea of, you know, women's studies turning into gender studies. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I mean, it's, just, it's, it's a lot to dive into right now, but there are a number of different factors that have contributed to why we are where we are right now. Yeah, we had uh, Sean McBurdy on the show from the main source of truth, and he's been very big on the, you know, males and female sports. And I know he's been going on right now about the one in Maine with the cross country runner Mm -hmm. that's continuing to just take places and things like that. So, you know, more strong advocates for things like that. And he helps out big time. So I want to jump into more of like a main picture thing with you, Tiffany, because what we're seeing right now is something that if anyone wants to look up Antonio Gramsci, which, um, Fun fact, Pete Buttigieg's father is the person that translated Antonio Gramsci's prison notes into um, into English so that everyone can understand it in the world. So there you go. You have a Maoist Marxist you, as Pete. your Mayor yeah. Pete. Yeah. yeah, Mayor Pete. You have a Maoist Marxist as your transportation secretary. Not a surprise. But Antonio Gramsci was big for the long march through the institutions. That was his big thing was a slow and steady drive which people need to understand with marxists with maoists with communists they are patient yeah they are patient they will take their time and they have so what have you seen with the long march that's been going on with everything with crt with equity with you know the maoist revolution coming in Uh, how have you seen it manifest itself in the schools and how do we combat it? Because it seems right now like it's so advanced. We're seeing it everywhere. Like David said, with the students marching for Palestine everywhere, left and right, with all the, like, the different uh, critical theories, with queer theory, with gender theory, with you know this new wave of feminism, all this type of stuff going on. How do we battle it? It seems like it's everywhere, and it seems like it's so pervasive right now. I think that the 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 glowing review of feminism and the women's liberation movement has to really be, you know, identified now as all of these young girls who want to cut off their healthy breasts and not become women. If there has not if there is not a, a real showing of the fact that um, the idea of feminism and women's liberation has failed, let it be that. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of things that they have tried to do that have backfired on them um, and that I think will continue to backfire, um, including the divisiveness that we're seeing and this anti-Semitic, this anti-Semitic kind mm-hmm. of decolonization movement that is now backfiring on them because the majority of Americans want absolutely no part in that. Mm-hmm. Um People are horrified. The idea that there were, you know, Israelis sleeping in their beds, their children playing, eating breakfast. And then all of a sudden they were ambushed and killed mm-hmm. and, and, and in the most horrific ways, yeah. uh, just completely dehumanizing. Um, so the majority of, of the people in America, I think, understand and know that that is just awful and that the Israelis need to defend themselves. And this idea that, you know, um, that Hamas somehow, you know, has some standing is just ridiculous. Um, but, you know, again, people are showing themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I, I'm new to this. You, you know, I I was a mom. Yeah. I, I was a business person. I decided to serve on school board because um, I really love my kids and I love my community. And I thought I could make a difference locally. Yeah. Um, and then I got on school board and even then. Um, you know, it took time to learn and to kind of try to understand because no one really wants to believe that there's this intentional um, work happening to drive a wedge between the parent and the child to, de- you know, to um, do away with the nuclear family. Right. These are our country was founded mm-hmm. on these principles of faith, of family, of freedom. Yep. Um, but during COVID, it was just undeniable. You know, I sat on that school board and I had seen evidence of indoctrination. There were concerns that I was continually having. I wasn't understanding why the system wasn't set up in order to help children to succeed and to engage parents. Um, I'm a disruptor by nature. So I asked a lot of questions. <laughs> Love it. Um, but when COVID happened and then, 
you know, I sat there on that school board and I just watched as these elected people thought that they had the power to take away the rights of of other people. It just blew my mind. Yeah. And I just kept turning around looking like, well, you people must be out of your minds. Who do you think you are to do this to other people and to parents and to make decisions for other people's children, right? The idea that parents have fundamental rights that are not granted by anyone else other than God or nature, Mm -hmm. nature's God. Like, you know, I had a conversation with a reporter today um, when they said something about, you know, what do you say to parents that don't agree with Moms for Liberty Liberty stance on parental rights? And I was like, I just want to be clear. What do they believe? Like, do they believe that the government gives them their parental rights? Like, well, no, 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 no. Govern me harder, daddy. (laughs) Sorry? Govern me harder, daddy. Like, that's exactly what they are. I mean, like, what? It just is, you know, what? And oh, no, no, no. That's not what they believe. But what do you say to parents that believe that, you know, they want their children taught about LGBTQ issues in school? You know, the vast majority of American parents send their kids, again, to to school to be college and career ready, uh, not to explore their sexuality. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think pushing back on this stuff with common sense is really important. But as far as the long march, I mean, it happened. Yeah. They were smart. They went in. They captured the institutions. They went into media. They went into education. They went into the administrative state. They put on the suits and they got the jobs and they did the work in order to rise to positions of power so that they could bring their friends in who could help to run things. And uh, it worked. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we just had elections um, on on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Uh, We've been involved in school board elections since 2022, endorsing candidates. We endorsed over 500 candidates in in 2022, and we won about 50 percent of those races. We endorsed a little over 200 candidates uh, in uh, 2023, uh, and we won about 90 of of those races. We won, and and so our but our win rate is around 44 percent for 2023. it's still really good. Absolutely. That's, it's a big influence. And, and yeah. The most important thing that I see uh, and the most important number that I look at is that 83 percent of the candidates that we endorsed in 2023 had never run for local office before. Mm-hmm. So we've begun our own march yep. through the institutions. We've begun our own march to reclaim our country. And uh, it's not going to happen overnight. And we're going to have to be patient and we're going to have to build support and community and funding and resilience and perseverance in this movement to save America. Um, but, you know, again, we're going to have to be patient. And and there is we are in the middle of a cultural revolution in this country. And these schools are being used as an initiation point for the indoctrination. And so I say to people often we can do a lot of things. There are a lot of important things that we need to do that leaders, presidents, secretaries, people need to do. Mm-hmm. But unless we reclaim America's public schools, we're really probably another generation yeah. away from losing our country completely. And we yep. can just sign it off. So I feel like we've been given this real gift with COVID. Yeah. Yeah. And that we need Silver to seize lining, upon yeah. it. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I call Silver it lemonade. Lining and COVID. COVID lemonade. Yeah, yeah. To, to take back to take back the country. <laughs> yeah, now, this that was like really big scope of, of a question. I now want to narrow that question down. <laughs> sure. Um, what would you say to parents just actively with their kids to make sure they don't get caught up in this web of what the public schools are doing, even with social media? I mean, just going on there to things you could see, especially because you know my brother has two young girls. What What would you say to parents? To, to do with their kids or to say to their kids or whatever to make to try to prevent any of that stuff from really taking any hold on them. Yeah, it's what my husband has done naturally. But James mm-hmm. tells people to do is to make them laugh at it. Show them the ridiculousness of what's happening. Be honest with them about some of the things that have happened. You know, you mm-hmm. need to talk about Mao and the Cultural yep. Revolution and the great leap forward that preceded mm-hmm. the Cultural Revolution mm-hmm. and the millions of people that died. Um, and and why that happened. You need to talk about Hitler. You need mm-hmm. to talk about Stalin mm-hmm. and Lenin and Pol Pot. We need to be mm-hmm. honest and talk about history and tell your kids about history. We need more anti-communist education in America. Yes, I think it's absolutely. incredibly important. And Moms for Liberty is working to help to create that mm-hmm. uh, and work on that. But uh, above all of it, you know, talk to your kids about it and get them to laugh at the nonsense. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, and and my husband has done that well with our kids where he just makes a joke and he's like, it's so ridiculous. And then they laugh and they think it's ridiculous. So you kind of just inoculate them Mm -hmm. against a lot of this. And I think that's probably one of the best things that parents can do, especially with teens, is to just make fun of it and to show them how ridiculous it is, you know, and uh, to remind them that women can't become men and men can't become women, no matter how many surgeries, medications or dresses they wear. Just play Mrs. Doubtfire over and over again and just treat it like the <laughs> comedy that it actually is. Man, that ruined that movie for me. I loved that movie when I was young. You know what? It, it is still a great movie. It's a great because movie. Because we could still, yeah. Robin Williams is still a genius. He is. Soul. So the he last is. thing I want to ask you about, and it's kind of, you know, it's got to be a tough thing because uh, Steven Crowder released three pages of the manifesto yes. of the Nashville trans shooter, Aubrey Hale, a uh, 28 year old went into a school with the intention. Now we know what we all, what we all thought, right? When we saw it happen, we assumed that this person was somebody who was propagandized, was influenced um, with a lot of the critical race theory, with a lot of the Marxism that was going through. And now as we read her diary, we saw that she was planning that she talks about white privilege. She talks about a lot of the buzzwords that you see as a mother, as a former school board member, as somebody that is now on the crusade that you're on with Moms for Liberty. What were your feelings, thoughts, emotions when you read those and knowing that there's probably a lot more pages of that um, that haven't been released yet? Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, as a, as, a, as a founder of Moms for Liberty, just the lack of transparency. Um, that uh, what happened and, and the reasoning for not releasing it and the secrecy around it is, is mm-hmm. concerning mm-hmm. Um, and and really scary. Yeah, um, if this was a white male going to an inner city school with the manifesto, it would have been out within been, hours. Yeah, hours. so, right. Um, you know, Bill Burr, Chris, Chris Elston is a good friend of mine and he Amazing talks guy. a lot about great, the great effects guy. of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones yep. on uh, mm-hmm. people. I don't think we talk enough about mm-hmm. medications. Yes. I always want to yes. know what medications I want to know about the guy in Maine. Yes. Was yes. he on, you know, medications? I want to know what medications Most he likely. was on. I don't think we Most. talk enough about oh, yeah. the effects of medications yep. on people and, and their moods and, and how it destabilizes them. Mm-hmm. Um, but beyond that, you know, if you're a white, the only thing worse than being a white girl is to be a white boy. Yeah. Uh, right. And yeah. so you look at this, you know, young woman, uh, white woman who can uh, do away with her uh, guilt mm-hmm. and privilege by uh, becoming uh, a victim, by uh, identifying as transgender or non-binary and um, it kind of becoming, um, you know, kind of shedding some of that white privilege by becoming mm-hmm. um, a, a, an oppressed class. Yep. And then you see the justification that happens once that identity is assumed. And um, this idea that somehow she's going to separate herself and then seek vengeance. And, you know, I, I was talking to another gentleman today and he was saying, you know, empathy is great. But that also then becomes a victim and perpetrator situation. And then you have this um, animosity that becomes breeded for the perpetrator Mm -hmm. um, that manifests in some way. And I think that's what we saw there. And uh, it's incredibly sad. Uh, What I know about uh, girls who go on puberty blockers and then cross-sex hormones is that um, testosterone makes you feel really, really good for a short period of time. Um, but over a longer period of time can breed a lot of aggression um, and uh, mental health issues as well as physical health issues. And we're not being honest about that. So the last thing I'd say about this issue of gender dysphoria or gender ideology in general is this. I go back to what I talk about with parents. Parents love their children. I believe the vast majority of parents want what is best for their kids. But around the issue of gender ideology or gender dysphoria or gender affirming care, and I say that in scare quotes, Mm -hmm. um, we're not being honest with moms and dads Mm -hmm. about what the effects of puberty blockers and cross sex hormones are. You know, parents deserve to know if they put their son on cross sex hormones, excuse me, on puberty blockers in the ages of nine to 11 during Tanner stage two. uh, They will never have an orgasm. Marcy Bowers, Dr. Bowers has said that, uh, that they know. And have evidence that these boys never have an orgasm in their life. What nine-year-old, 10-year-old, 11-year-old can make the decision to never have uh, an orgasm or intimacy, sexual intimacy with another person in that way? What, um, 
what girl can decide that she never wants to have babies or to breastfeed? I saw a mm-hmm. uh, uh, um, a post by a, a woman who's in her twenties now who said, "You know, I wish someone had just told me yeah. to wait." Yeah. before I cut off my breasts when I was yeah. a teenager. And my answer back to that was, you know, to your point about puberty before, like, I didn't know that I wanted to have four kids when I was yeah. 12. No. <laughs> I, You know, and much less to breastfeed all four of them, which I did. And it was a wonderful experience that I absolutely loved. I loved being pregnant mm-hmm. and I loved nursing my babies. There was something very special and fulfilling about that interaction with my children and being able to provide them and nourish them with my mm-hmm. own body. Um, and the idea that, you know, you're having teenage girls that are making that decision, giving that up is just uh, horrific. Yeah, it's and so I, so I just feel like we need to give parents accurate information. This idea you say, you know, you want to, do you want a dead daughter or a live son is a lie. Yeah. And we just need to give parents accurate and honest information. And I have to believe in my heart that most parents knowing all of the harms and the concerns mm-hmm. when it comes to this gender affirming care, again, in scare quotes, uh, most parents are going to make a different decision. Yeah. I was actually going to say, I wanted to go one step further than you and not say that not even not being honest or being inaccurate, they're actively threatening parents saying Mm -hmm. dead daughter or live son. Like it's not even just inaccuracy. It's literally threatening them saying your, your child's just going to die. They're going to opt themselves. if you don't do this. So you have to do this. Right. And you know, what? yeah. And you talk to the detransitioners and they say, you know, they don't blame their parents. They feel like Mm -hmm. their parents were lied to. Mm Mm-hmm. And, you know, in the end, it's just, you know, if I'm if you're a kid right now listening or if you're a parent and your child says I'm trans, just convince them to wait. Right. Because, you know what? Kids go through things. They go through things. And as they're going through puberty, your child may come to you and say, hey, I don't think I'm a boy anymore. And, you know, I'm not going to tell anybody how to parent, but I feel like the best way, especially in this current environment is wear whatever clothes you want. Do what you want at the time. Just don't do anything permanent. Mm -hmm. wait until you're an adult and then when you're an adult that's you know go for it but i don't do anything permanent now because you are still developing Mm -hmm. and i feel like that is the best strategy because you know kids are kids they're gonna they're gonna go with fads and right now being uh, being a victim right now is a major fad now unfortunately this fad has real consequences but it is a fad for kids right now and they're going to want to go with the trend so it's a difficult it's a really difficult thing for parents right now of those, like, you know, high school, middle school age kids to battle with. But overall, we just got to get through it. And with people like Tiffany Justice on our side, I really think we will. Tiffany, thank you yep. so much for coming on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to talk about these important topics in such a serious way. We oh, appreciate yeah. you for coming on. Are you kidding me? Yeah. And we appreciate it. And, you know, I got to thank our good buddy, Adam Coleman. He uh, He's the one. Oh, I love Adam. Out here and he connected mm-hmm. us because Adam, yeah, Adam's amazing. Mm-hmm. He came on the show many moons ago yeah, you know, that. and just a great guy. Uh, go follow Adam Substack if you haven't. Go search Adam B. Coleman. Mm-hmm. Um, but Tiffany, anything you want to plug? You talked about your town halls. If you want to, you know, talk about them again and anywhere people can find you on social media. Yeah. So November 13th, Atlanta, there'll be a town hall. Tina's hosting that. It's going to be wonderful. Um, We're going to have a lot of different elected officials out going to talk about the state of education in Georgia. And what we call them is giving parents a voice. So the microphone goes into the hands of parents and they get to ask questions and share concerns. Uh, We'll be in Chicago December 2nd, as I said, at the New Beginnings Church. Um, I think that's going to start at three o'clock. So if you're listening and you want to come out in Chicago, please come and join us. And then always, Uh, Go to momsforliberty.org. You can click to join a chapter or you can click to start one. And the last thing I say and I try to always say is um, you need to start asking yourself, why not me? Uh, What can I do and why not me? Why not me running for office? Why not me starting a chapter of Moms for Liberty? Why not me starting a podcast and talking about these important issues? Right. So um, everyone has a gift that they've been given in life. And uh, now's the time to use that in order to uh, save our country, because I really feel like America is in a place where uh, we've been given an incredible opportunity to save Mm -hmm. our our country. But it's Mm -hmm. going to take a lot of effort. Absolutely. I couldn't have said it better myself. Dave, do you have anything to say before we get out of here? Uh, Yeah. On uh, 
on the topic of saving America, I also feel like if we don't save America, there's not a lot of places to go afterwards. So I think it is very imperative, not only because we love our country and obviously we want all the all the kids to actually have an ability to grow and do well in the country. But there's not going to be much after America because there's not many great places that are doing well, especially with all this stuff, uh, even actually doing worse than us, I would say. So very good thing to save right now. Yeah, certainly is. El Salvador is not big enough for all of us. And El Salvador <laughs> seems to be doing better than us right now with a lot of things. But at least with crime. <laughs> the, yeah, at least with crime. They crack down. But so again, everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you like what you heard, like, share, follow, subscribe, rate five stars, Spotify and iTunes. Spread this word of mouth. Go find us on the socials at the Alex Cuesta Show. We will be back next week with another amazing guest. We appreciate everyone for listening. So long, everybody.